Well, good evening and a warm welcome to you all to this Royal Aeronautical Society Sopwith named lecture. I'm Brian Burridge and I'm the Chief Executive of the Society. And a particular welcome tonight to our speakers this evening, Greg Ulmer, the Executive Vice President of the Aeronautics Business of Lockheed Martin Corporation, and Paul Livingston, the Chief Executive of Lockheed Martin UK. The plan is that we'll hear from both our speakers in that order and follow with a question and answer session. And we'll aim to finish at 18.15 UK time. Now this is an important fixture in the society's calendar. The Sopwith name lecture was established back in 1990 and it was uh, enshrined to honor the achievements of Sir Thomas Sopwith, an honorary fellow of the society. In the years prior to World War I, Sopwith became England's premier aviator and established the first authoritative test pilot school in the world. He also founded England's first major flight school, and that was based on the proceedings of a £4,000 prize he'd just won for the longest flight from England to the continent in a British-built aeroplane. And such was the way back then that the UK's advance in aerospace was funded mostly from prizes. And between 1912 and 1920, Sopwith's company produced over 16,000 aircraft of 60 types, but it was actually a struggle. Spanish flu rampaged across the globe in the immediate post-World uh, post War I years. And the local Kingston papers of the day bear testament to the impact on the nearby Sopwith factory. Also, the market slumped after World War I, and that meant that up to September 1920, just after a couple of years after the war, the Sopwith company built only 15 aircraft. While trying to diversify and maintain employment by moving into production of motor car bodies, motorcycles, and even aluminium saucepans. Then, in 1920, the Treasury launched a huge claim against the Sopwith Company for excess war profits. The company went into receivership and was wound up within weeks, but did meet all the liabilities to its creditors. A few months later, Sopwith launched the HG Hawker Engineering Company Limited, with himself as chairman, Fred Sigrist as chief engineer, and Harry Hawker as designer and test pilot. The company very soon recruited Sidney Cam to work as a designer under Fred Singrist, and Cam went on to design 52 different aircraft types, which sold almost 30,000 aircraft, including uh, the famous ones like the Hawker Hart, the Hurricane, the Hunter, and the Harrier. And the interesting thing about Singrist is that he was originally recruited by Sopwith in 1910 as a chauffeur, mechanic, and general dog's body but rapidly became an outstanding and largely self-taught factory manager. So we can recognize three familiar points that Sopwith knew well. Aerospace is a long-term game. Great things can come out of adversity and it's the sheer doggedness of the human spirit that makes it all possible. And now to our speakers. Uh, Greg Ulmer runs the Lockheed Martin Aeronautics business and that's um, a 20, a billion plus, a dollar plus enterprise employing some 30,000 people. It includes the fifth generation tactical aircraft, air mobility aircraft, unmanned and ISR platforms, and ranges obviously across the F-35, the F-22, the F-16, and the C-130, as well as advanced development programs at Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. Greg has more than 30 years of experience in the defense and aerospace industry. And before this, he was the vice president and general manager for the F-35 Lightning II program, following a number of years in other roles in that part of the business. But along the way, he was an executive, an ops executive in the Skunk Works and started life as a flight engineer, flight test engineer, supporting the MD-11, the C-17 and the C-130J. And moving to our second speaker, Paul Livingston, Fellow of the Society, is Chief Executive of Lockheed Martin UK and is accountable for the totality of Lockheed Martin's business with the United Kingdom. He's been around the company for 20 years or so and notably was previous Managing Director for Ascent Flying Training 
having led the company's bid for the UK military flying training system. And Paul began his career at Singer Lynx Miles in 1987. And the uh, term Lynx conjures up many hours of pilots of my generation spent in the uh, Lynx trainer. And Paul was an engineering apprentice working in civil and military simulation. On completion of that apprenticeship, he was selected to spend a year in Sunnyvale, California, to develop code for the world's first eye-slaved visual system. And that should tell all you young people in our audience all you need to know about the value of an apprenticeship. As for tonight's subject, the F-35 is pivotal to the RAF's front line and to the carrier strike capability. And only last week, aircraft flew uh, combat missions off the Queen Elizabeth carrier alongside your US Marine Corps jets. A couple of months earlier, the UK's Integrated Defence and Security Review was just a little coy about future numbers. So it'll be very useful to hear from Greg and Paul as they outline the critical role that the F-35 programme plays in supporting the UK's ambition to be a global science and technology superpower. And all that, that means for technology, jobs and the economy. Greg, over to you. Thank you um, and good evening and welcome from Fort Worth, Texas. Um, very much appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all this evening. Uh, as mentioned, this lecture is named in honor of Thomas Tony Sopwith and helps increase the desire for aviation advancements. As a pioneer for industry, Sopwith helped pave the way for flight and aircraft production. It's an honor to be a part of the Sopwith lecture alongside my colleague, Paul Livingston. Paul and I both believe it is extremely important for us to gather leaders and visionaries from around the globe and across the military, as well as from business and academia. The Royal Aeronautical Society allows us the opportunity in Sopwith's name to gather and enable innovation and collaboration to take place and further drive advancements in both air and in space. Thank you again for today's host for facilitating these discussions and conversations. Today, I'd like to share with you some of the history of the F-35 program, how it has helped strengthen and sustain the UK's combat air sector, where the program is today, and how we will continue adding advanced capabilities while driving down costs, as well as how Lockheed Martin is investing in the technologies that will enable um, the future of air combat going forward. While there are many exciting developments ahead for the F-35 program and Lockheed Martin, equally it's as important in the long-standing history we have with the UK that has spurred us both to look forward to the horizon of technology and allowed us to gain mutual benefit from that collaboration. Uh, I myself, as mentioned, um, supported the C-130J program from first flight all the way through certification. I worked very closely with the United Kingdom and their local team in Marietta, Georgia in support of that program. Uh, about 14 years of my career supported that effort in collaboration with the United Kingdom. Henry Ford, founder of the Ford Motor Company and chief developer of the assembly line technique of mass production said it best, coming together is the beginning, staying together is progress, but working together is success. The United Kingdom and the United States relationship, I believe is a testament to what Ford describes as success, particularly the F-35 program, which builds on a long-standing partnership between Lockheed Martin and the United Kingdom and the United States, as well as drives meaningful collaboration and innovation across industry and around the globe in general. We are proud to have had the UK as the only tier one, the only tier one partner during the system development and demonstration phase of the program. The United Kingdom's defense industry has played a significant key role in the F-35 program since its inception. Our nations have worked side by side to develop the F-35 into a formidable program that it is today. A prime example of this partnership is illustrated by the F-35, also known as the short takeoff and vertical landing variant in regards to the lift system developed by Rolls-Royce. That development of that system began more than 20 years ago. The challenge was to provide a safe and robust short takeoff and vertical landing system for the F-35B within the physical confines of a common airframe that aligns with both the A model, the conventional takeoff landing and landing aircraft, as well as the C model, the carrier variant um, for, 
designed and developed specifically for the United States Navy. The result was a first of its kind integrated system that combines a center mounted lift band, a downward swiveling rear nozzle, and flight stabilizing under ring roll posts, all activated at the push of a single button. It's, the, it's this unique short takeoff and vertical landing capability of the F-35 that gives the UK a strategic carrier strike advantage. I personally have talked to many Harrier pilots relative to the difference between a Harrier and the F-35, and hands down, um, the Harrier pilots very much appreciate the F-35 and its new capabilities. Rolls-Royce is among more than 45 United Kingdom companies that contribute to the F-35 program. From the Martin Baker ejection seat, to the Cobham refueling probe, to the BAE systems built aft fuselage and horizontal tails, every F-35 has British parts incorporated from nose to tail. Through the work of British industry, the F-35 program generates tremendous economic benefits to the United Kingdom, as well as ensures long-term develop, development of British jobs and skills. UK companies alone build 15% of value of the more than 3,000 planned F-35s driving significant export revenue as well as GDP growth for the United Kingdom. The program maintains and develops UK intellectual property along with supporting high skill, high value jobs with a projection of creating and supporting more than 20,000 jobs per year across every region of the UK for decades to come. And we know there will continue to be opportunity for industry as capability advancements and insertion continue through the life of the program, which is projected to endure through the 2070 timeframe. We are particularly proud of the capital investment in and knowledge and technology transfer to the United Kingdom, including the B at BAE Salmsbury, where the, where the F-35 aft fuselage horizontal, horizontal tails are manufactured and assembled with a six, just over 600 million pound investment, 3.3 billion pound value of technical data transfer, and almost 30 million pounds of training and technical assistance in terms of design, manufacture, installation, repair, and operation of the F-35. The F-35 has helped strengthen and sustain the UK's combat air sector as well. Additionally, the F-35 program mostly benefits the Northwest economically and by providing um, significant employment there. From a defense and security aspect, our partnership yet again fits Ford's definition of success. The F-35 also reinforces the UK's alliance with your strongest allies by driving collaboration across industry, government, as well as the military. As General Jeff Harrigan, also known as COBRA of the United States Air Force, so eloquently stated at the F-35 rollout ceremony for Denmark just a few short months ago, he quoted, he said, quote, baked into this platform is interoperability, lethality, and a mindset a culture of fifth generation attitudes that understands the importance of training, exercising and operating together as an alliance because we share the same values. Through our work together, through our mutual success together, the F-35 program will continue to derive prosperity and ensure security for decades to come. Today, the F-35's advanced capabilities such as stealth, sensor fusion and electronic warfare give its operators an unparalleled advantage against near peer adversaries. And we are working closely with our customers to continually deliver the cutting edge technologies and capabilities needed to outpace rapidly advancing threats. As we look to the future, our technolog technological advancements and focus on digital transformation continues to create disruptive innovation in our processes, technologies and tools, driving faster deliveries, agile responsiveness, and data-driven insights for our customers. By employing data as a strategic asset and focusing on F-35 affordability in both production and sustainment, we continue to drive down the cost of the F-35. The program provides 21st century capability at the same or less cost of late 20th century fourth gen fighters. By investing in new technologies to enhance reliability and maintainability of the jet, we've lowered Lockheed Martin's portion of F-35 sustainment costs per flight hour by 44% over the past five years, and we expect that we will lower that figure another 40% over the next five years going forward. One way we can accomplish this is through constant pursuit of opportunities to automate redundant systems and processes, um, both on the airframe and in sustainment of the weapon system. 
In 2020 alone, we worked on more than 100 additional robotic projects for the F-35 production system. And if you walk through our factories, both here and in Fort Worth and in Salisbury, you will see the same industry 4.0 technologies you may use at home, like smart tools and connected machines that speed production and improve quality. The Common Analysis Toolset Data Manager tool is just one example of Lockheed Martin's mission-driven transformation on the F-35 program. This tool generates an aircraft structural digital twin and is used to host and deliver F-35 structural engineering data and products to our customers in a connected graphical way. Because we have implemented this advanced capability, Lockheed Martin has documented a 75% cost reduction in delivering data products like force structure maintenance plans and individual aircraft tracking reports compared with historical methods. And we're not stopping with the F-35. Behind the scenes, we have projects like Star Drive at the Skunk Works to help advance and accelerate our operations and innovations. Star Drive is a multi-year upfront investment to re-engineer how we develop and build aircraft, introducing processes and tools that operate in a fully integrated digital work environment and connect previously disparate systems together. Through the digital born star drive prototypes, we are bringing mission driven transformation to life. These prototypes are delivering results, faster build times, less rework, greater accuracy, and, dec and decreased schedules to first flight. And while star drive looks to the next generation of air power solutions, we're taking lessons learned and incorporating on existing programs every step of the way, not just at aeronautics, but across our entire Lockheed Martin portfolio. Investments in digital engineering, advanced manufacturing, and next-gen software development, development enable us to field technologies on the F-35 that ensure operators stay ahead of ever-advancing threats and can perform on every single mission. The F-35 is capable and flexible, able to perform high-end missions like striking targets deep in enemy, enemy territory or suppressing and destroying enemy air defenses while avoiding detection. At the same time, it can continue to perform low-end missions more traditionally associated with fighter aircraft, like close air support in a more permissive environment. The F-35 can also operate well beyond the standard fighter mission set. Today, we see the F-35 defining the 21st century battle space. This is something we like to talk a lot about at Lockheed Martin and are laser focused on starting with our CNO, Jim Takelet, all the way down. We know that our customers' dominance on operations will be determined by our ability to bring together high-tech platforms into one cohesive network that spans every domain, air, land, sea, space, and cyber. When this network communicates and analyzes data seamlessly, it represents a force multiplier that is flexible, formidable, and decisive. Thanks to the advanced sensors and enhanced network-enabled operations, a fleet of F-35s can share information seamlessly with one another and with other fourth-gen assets, and with naval systems or ground, air, or other space assets, making the whole force more effective. I'm proud to say that Lockheed Martin continues to lead the industry in integrating, testing, and maturing open mission systems compliant, open system architectures. We have demonstrated connectivity between the F-35, the F-22, U-2, and ground-based capabilities, including, including U.S. Army long-range missile systems, to increase synergies across systems that empower and optimize the joint force and shorten the kill chain. This multi-domain integration or joint all-domain operations gives the F-35 the ability to act as a system of systems, data producer and data consumer, and data share in a vast connected network. The F-35 also bus, boasts the active electronic scan array, radar, distributed aperture system, electro-optical targeting system, and helmet-mounted display system, making it the most advanced communication and sensor suite of any fighter in history. All of this information gathered through these suites is automatically shared with F other F-35 pilots and command and control operators to create a common battle space picture and unprecedented situational awareness. This allows the focus to be on the fight, not the flight, but on the fight. The exciting part of everything I have just shared is that this is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the F-35 program and what is on the horizon. Our strong relationship with the United Kingdom and the United States will be critical as we continue to accelerate and move the needle with multi-domain integration and ensure an even stronger future. 
board said that working together is success. And I think the partnership between our countries clearly confirms what he said. The success we have had together and will continue to have as a result of our long and strong standing collaboration. Our commitment to collaborating the, with the United Kingdom and with the United States on long-term programs like the F-35 is critical to maintaining the confidence of our allies in future collaborations. We're seeing many of the capabilities I've talked about here today come to life as part of the ongoing carrier strike group deployment. F-35Bs from the Royal Air Force 617 Squadron and from the United States Marine Corps are on board HMS Queen Elizabeth for this month long, for a, for a month's long deployment that will cover 26,000 nautical miles from the North Atlantic to the Indo-Pacom. Recently, during that deployment, the UK took a big step toward two strike carrier to a two strike carrier navy when an F-35 was the first F-35 to also land aboard HMS Prince of Wales. Commodore Steve Morehouse, commander of the UK's carrier strike group said, the strategic significance of the F-35 operating from the Prince of Wales, as well as the HMS Queen Elizabeth was profound. It means Britain has a continuous carrier strike capability with one vessel always ready to respond, he said. Few other navies can do that. Britain is back in the front rank of maritime naval power. These powerful words embody the sentiments and excitement we share for the future of the United Kingdom's F-35 fleet. The partnership we share, the benefits that have resulted from our special relationship, and the hope we have for what's next is unique and has set up to be successful for decades to come. Thank you for your time this evening. Paul, I'll turn it over to you before we open the floor for questions and answers. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Sir Brian. And it's a pleasure to be with you all today. I really regret we're not doing this at Hamilton Place and able to go for a drink afterwards. Greg's in Fort Worth, I'm in London. But despite that, it's still an honor for Lockheed Martin and for me as the new chief executive to be delivering the annual Sopwith Lecture. Greg has described the critical role that international and industrial collaboration and investment play in delivering innovative defense capabilities. The F-35 program not only brings together great ingenuity and technology from across allied nations to deliver interoperable forces, it also benefits the UK, both socially and economically. As Greg has said, the F-35 program is the preeminent example of how defense supports leveling up. Almost 50% of those 20,000 jobs it provides are in the northwest of the United Kingdom. It's also an excellent example of the defense and security industrial strategy in action. Greg highlighted the significant investments the program has made in infrastructure, digital manufacturing and training in the UK. The F-35 has developed onshore sovereign UK capabilities in the combat air sector. And revenues from the program worth over £40 billion up to 2038 alone let companies invest in cutting edge R&D in combat air and in other technologies for defence and civil sectors. So the F-35 supports the UK's ambition to be a global science and technology power. But I would like to talk about the important role the defence industry plays beyond just designing critical platforms and systems. First of all, defence is here to deliver missions, not commercial contracts. For the F-35, Lockheed Martin and its industry partners have staff deployed on board HMS Queen Elizabeth, supporting the carrier strike group's deployment and operations. Beyond the F-35, we also provide personnel giving operational support for the nuclear deterrent. Over the last year, we've supported the UK's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. We've used our 3D printing capabilities across the UK to produce personal protective equipment for the National Health Service, local authorities and care workers, as have many others in the defence industry. We directly supported the establishment of a national testing laboratory at Audley Park in Cheshire. We supported local communities through charitable donations and the individual voluntary efforts of our own staff. We invest in innovative companies that help accelerate genome sequencing and vaccine development and we accelerated over 600 million pounds of early payments to UK businesses 
to help them through these uncertain and challenging times. Defence does level up the UK and it strengthens the Union. Lockheed Martin has operated here in the UK for over 80 years. From 1939 to 1945, we worked in Liverpool, the Midlands, Scotland and Northern Ireland to produce 12 different types of aircraft for the Royal Air Force. This complemented the production by Hawker Aircraft, as Sir Brian noted, the second company founded by Sir Thomas Sopwith, building on the sterling work of his first company, the Sopwith Aviation Company, which produced aircraft, of course, for Allied forces during the First World War. Today, Lockheed Martin works in over 20 locations around the country, from Scotland and Wales to Cornwall. We provide the postal sorting technologies for Royal Mail. We, deliver the first, we will deliver the UK's first ever vertical space launch, and we support various elements of national security endeavours. We invest £1.6 billion a year, supporting 20,000 jobs and over 1,000 companies. 80% of those companies are small and medium-sized enterprises. This shows the benefits of inward investment in the defence sector. Yeah, Lockheed Martin is a US headquartered company, but we're also a multinational company with a significant onshore presence here in the United Kingdom. The reach back, however, to the world's largest defence and aerospace company means that we can invest. The benefits can be seen from the F-35 programme. BAE Systems, GE, Martin Baker, Leonardo in the Fruit Forward Selects guys, Cobham, Ultra, UTC Actuation and Rolls-Royce immediately come to mind, and Greg's mentioned some of them when you're thinking of our industrial partners. But what about the smaller, specialist, highly skilled and focused suppliers? In the fishing town of Stranraer in southwest Scotland, just over 100 people work for Gentex. They make the high-tech helmet systems and components worn by every F-35 Lightning II pilot. In North Wales, Sealand Support Services will maintain and repair all F-35 aircraft in Europe and potentially others worldwide. That work's worth potentially two and a half billion pounds to the economy. In Northern Ireland, highly skilled innovation leads the way in Survitech with the crucial survival equipment and anti-G clothing that ensures the pilots can cope with the high levels of acceleration that the F-35 delivers to them. And towards the south coast, RE Thompson, which provides gear systems for the F-35, has doubled in size because of this programme alone. Beyond the F-35, Lockheed has continued to support the growth of the UK space sector. We have worked with companies like Moog, Astra and Tyvek to establish manufacturing facilities and supply chains in the UK and to export UK products back to the United States. We are keen to invest more in space, to grow and diversify the UK's onshore satellite manufacturing in collaboration with industrial partners and the UK government. And we're exploring opportunities to invest for complex and disruptive weapons, like anti-ship weapons, directed energy and hypersonics. And for helicopters, we can build on our rich heritage with the Merlin platform, our worldwide reputation from Black Hawk, and our work on future vertical lift technologies at Sikorsky. But defence companies do much more. We support multiple sectors. Earlier, I mentioned our work with Royal Mail. The Royal Mail uses our image recognition software to categorise and sort 11 billion letters and parcels every year, underpinning a critical communications infrastructure, which in the pandemic was even more important. Not many know that the image recognition capability that's provided by Lockheed Martin and is based on the investments made in sensing and artificial intelligence technology originally developed to meet defence requirements. We are also investing in space launch capabilities. These have civil as well as defence applications. They could allow the UK to open a new global low Earth orbit economy for research and development in microgravity environments. There's already interest in that from the health and agritech sectors. This again could support the UK in becoming a science and technology superpower. And we're investing in the UK's rich ecosystem of innovative startups, 
academic spin-offs and small and medium-sized enterprises. Since 2019, Lockheed Martin's Venture Capital Fund has been investing millions of pounds in the UK through a partner fund. We and our peers are strategic partners across multiple sectors. Our heritage, large presence and investment allows us to adapt and support national initiatives and infrastructure. And building on that, my final point, defence supports social value. The government rightly expects that its procurements, including those for defence, will help fight climate change, promote equal opportunity, enhance well-being, tackle economic inequality and support the recovery from COVID-19. These sit at the core of Lockheed Martin's approach to business. I've already spoken about how we've supported the UK's COVID response and recovery. This continues. I've spoken about how our work supports jobs and the levelling up agenda. This will also continue. On climate change, Lockheed Martin has a global Go Green 2030 carbon goal, including our facilities here in the UK. We are committed to outperforming the science-based target to prevent 1.5 degrees of warming. Since we started Go Green, we have reduced atmospheric carbon emissions by 47%, our landfill by 51%, and energy consumption by 19%. And work continues as we shift towards making defence capabilities green. And while we are constantly improving our workforce inclusion and diversity, my personal aim is to ensure Lockheed Martin is a place where people from every background and human experience are able to bring the best of themselves to work every day. We, of course, have focus initiatives in many DNI areas. And especially at the moment, we're looking at how we develop our post pandemic work environment to allow greater flexibility for our team and greater output for our customers. Prosperity, innovation, and social impact sit alongside each other, and the defense sector has a strong foundation on which to build. So, how can we enhance these strengths and do more? First, I want to see us con to continue moving away from overly commercial transactional contracts and relationships. We must collaborate on mission outcomes for defence, for security, for social value. Secondly, moving the needle will mean we need new ways of collaborating and co-investing, including an appetite for higher risk research and development and infrastructure investment. Finally, inward investment will allow the UK to leapfrog its ambitions for defence and social value. The UK should encourage this to help grow onshore skills, maximise value for money and contribute to prosperity. I was very proud to be uh, announced as a member of Lord Grimstone's UK Investment Council, which will make recommendations to ensure a competitive regulatory environment that supports inward investment and entrepreneurial growth. I also look forward to working with the Ministry of Defence on the practical implication of the defence and securities industrial strategy in ways that support investment and international collaboration, building on the success of programmes like the F-35. In the end, this all comes down to people working with people, sometimes wearing different badges, logos or flags, but all with a shared vision. I'm confident that we will all become more collaborative for the defence of space aerospace, space and social value. So on behalf of Greg and myself, thank you for listening and we look forward to your questions. Well, thanks to both of you for uh, that uh, insight into both the F-35 programme and the way it fits into the UK. There's a lot of questions and I'll uh, I'll approach them thematically. Uh, there's quite a lot about the F-35, obviously, but there's some broader questions covering space, climate change, those sorts of things. So um, right off the top, and it's to do with exports, it won't surprise you. Uh, first question is news in the last few hours that the, Switzerland has chosen the F-35. Can you make any more comment on that? Um, and um, about the nature of the winning package and will it change work share? 
So Ryan, uh, you know, it's a very exciting day for us. Uh, we just learned probably a couple hours before um, this webinar that the F-35 was chosen. So 34, 36 aircraft, I should say, chosen in support of the Swiss competition. Um, as I understand it, I don't have all of the details, but uh, there were four different categories in the competition, effectiveness, um, product support, uh, cooperation, and offset. And the F-35 ranked first in three of the four. Um, so uh, very strong performance. It also was uh, quoted as being about two um, billion francs below the next competition relative to the the source selection. So very strong performance, I think, from an affordability perspective. Um, so it's exciting time for the program from an offset or a work share perspective. It's the partnership, uh, the requirements are set within the partnership. So it, it will not change um, the, the partnership relationship. So the UK offset agreement or partnership work content will not change as a result of that. Actually, um, they will benefit um, so every aircraft produced will still have, you know, every aft fuselage produced by BAE, every helmet, as Paul alluded to, will have UK content. Every aircraft will have a Martin Baker ejection seat in it. So it very much grows the, the production scope of the program as well as on the sustainment side. Um, that said, you know, each, each nation, Switzerland and others, want um, the ability to self-sustain their platform. So we will be working as we do with all customers rather relative to the ability to self-sustain and support their aircraft. Yeah, thank you. Um, and congratulations on that. Um, it's an important win for you. Um, and, and related to that, how, um, with the benefit of hindsight and uh, some years have gone by, but how significant do you think it was for the UK to be the sole tier one partner or you know any tier one partner what what's what do you think are the lasting legacies of that relationship compared with the sort of industrialization that you tend to go through with um, any purchasing nation well you know you you look at the f-35 and i think some of the you know it took a long time to get through the system development and demonstration phase of the program but the the relationship that we established with the uk uh, industry base associated working through that if you think about the helmet if you think about the lift fan if you think about um, the systems on the airplane the ejection seat and the escape system it's very complex um, and then from a data fusion and a capability point of view um, and the sensor suite on the aircraft, it's also complex. So we worked uh, and sweated together relative to the development of that. And you create lasting, enduring relationships in that regard. Um, so um, just within this week, I have been on the phone with UK industry, in particular uh, BAE, relative to the future of the program, the, the cooperation, um, the jointness still that remains today and will for, for the life of this program. Thanks. And um, uh, related to that, um, and, and this is probably something that Paul will have a, a view on as well. Um, the airplane, as it came into UK service, represented a huge jump in complexity. And in terms of the technology involved, the degree of integration, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what did that mean, do you think? for the sort of skills transfer, building up the expertise on both the front line and in depth maintenance, et cetera. And uh, what, what, um, what sort of approach did the company take on that? Well, from a complexity point of view, in some aspects, in many aspects, it's actually simpler. Um, so the way that we can um, fuse data, present data, um, integrate data, we can make it a lot simpler um, to the end user. From a troubleshooting point of view, for example, from a maintenance point of view, the diagnostic system on the aircraft, the prognostic system on the aircraft, um, we have the ability as the, as the aircraft is flying to essentially self-report its condition. And so um, very much, um, very, a lot, in many ways, more simplistic. I will also say the, uh, the younger generation in particular, it seems very keen kind of on that ability and that technology, not to take away, because I have uh, myself is very keen <laughs> on those technologies, but I will say there's a resonance, if you will, um, 
Um, the way we present data through the HUD, for example, um, I have been in demonstrations where we've had senior pilots um, talk about there is no way that the human can absorb and collect that information. And the pilot in the simulation that I was sitting in turned to the general and said, you mean this, 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 and this? And he obviously had full understanding of the, of the battle space situational awareness. And I think it's, it's, um, it's a different mindset, but it seems to have a resonance and we seem to be very successful with that. Paul, I'd offer maybe your perspectives. Yeah, that, thanks, Craig. I think just going back to, to Brian, the, the, last, the bit of the previous question, there's also the operational relationship was built during through the SDD phase, right? So the, the relationships that there are between the Royal Air Force, the US Navy, the US Marine Corps, the Fleet Air Arm of the Royal Navy are unparalleled. And we see those play out right now on Carrier Strike Group 21 with the interoperability. We've gone, I think, in CSG 21 beyond interoperability into, I think, what the first Sea Lord referred to last year on a carrier as interchangeability, right? Because literally you can, you know, a, a plane will land on the deck and there'll be a, you know, a US Marine Corps tech on one side of it and a Royal Navy tech on the other side of it. It's the foundation of those relationships, I believe, goes all the way back to that SDD phase. So I just wanted to hit that point. In terms of the UK skill base, I mean, both through design, development, and, and now into the sustainment phase as well. And, and don't forget, F-35 will continue to grow in capability as time goes on. It's, it's absolutely clear to me that the skills transfer that has gone on over several years really has underpinned the UK's ability to stay kind of in the combat air game. You know, clearly some of the things that are around the Tempest program are skill bases and technologies that have flown through, pardon the pun, from the F-35 program. And, and also what's really great now is to see, you know, our own Lockheed Martin employees and employees of our partner companies on the ground at Marham with their sleeves rolled up, being the people who are operating the autonom autonomous logistics information system. I can never say that word, um, Alice for short. Um, but, you know, it, 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 as I said in my, in my remarks earlier, We've got people on the carrier supporting it as they go as they go forward. So those are all skills that I think you know are there for the next generations. And certainly when we look to the future, you know, we're not just trying to recruit people that come out of the forces and that's absolutely an important place in our business for veterans, but also, and I always will bang the apprenticeship drum, right? Of being an ex-apprentice. But these kind of programs are the kind of things that when you go and talk to young kids who are looking at apprenticeships and technical colleges and vocational training, show them a picture of the F-35 or a Merlin helicopter, and they're like, okay, that's cool. I'll, I'll, I'll come do that. I'll come work on it. And, um, you, you know, related to that, and again, a tactical point, but what sort of feedback have you had from Marham, from the schoolhouse for training technicians and maintainers? I'll start with this one, then hand it over to Greg. So, declaring an interest here, my apprenticeship, as you pointed out, Sir Brian, was in the simulation trade. So I was used to hanging, you know, oscilloscopes off there and off circuit boards and trying to work out, you know, what gates were being flipped between ones and zeros, albeit a very long time ago. So um, you go there now, and the experience. Of, of, of being in these simulators compared to the ones we were even building a few years ago. Don't, don't go all the way back to my history, right? But, you know, it's kind of like going from an old Nokia flip phone to an iPhone 12. I mean, it's that gargantuan a leap in technology and experience. You know, the visual systems, which was my original specialization, were, are just phenomenally realistic. You know, and you now look at it, you know, and it's up there with, some of the best games engines that are out there. And in fact, anyone who knows about simulation will know that actually it used to be all, all the high-end simulation was in the military and civil aviation. Game companies took that over and have drove, driven that technology to a point where we now pull the games technology into the military world because the, the visuals are so realistic. So it's been, I think, a really great experience. And of course, they've now got the deployable simulators that are actually on board the carrier. So that means they're able to do that quality of training on board 
both in terms of con consistency continuation training but also mission rehearsal which i'm sure has been pretty useful in the situation the csg is currently in uh, greg did you want to add anything there i'd just pile on to what paul was talking about i mean the the feedback we get uh, from the maintainers and, and in the United States in particular, and I don't have direct feedback from the Marum team, but in the United States, when we talk to the, the mechanics and technicians and you talk about kind of comparing legacy F-16, F-15, F-18 with an F-35, um, none of them want to go back relative to the, the technology and the aspects. And in the visual representation that Paul refers to, we actually have virtual reality kinds of devices either on an iPad or actually on goggles to work up on the aircraft as you perform your work. So um, it is very transformational relative to the capabilities we're seeing. And the, the resonance with the workforce is dramatic. Um, just sticking with the sort of internationalization of the program, um, and just to prove we're a global society, I've got a couple of points from India coming. Um, and um, uh, the first is just to remind me that it was Tommy Sobwith who set medical standards for pilots in his original test pilot school. And we have an aviation medicine specialist group, so they would insist that I know that. Um, but secondly, there's a question here. Uh, what, what are your investment thoughts about India? From an F-35 or in general? Well, um, uh, both, starting with the F-35 and then onwards. Yeah, from, a, from an investment point of view, really we have to look to the United States government and a government-to-government -government agreement relative to the ability to export India. So we will follow suit to that. Uh, we are um, working with the government of India, obviously, on C-130J and other Lockheed Martin aspects. Uh, we've also are interested, perhaps, in some F-16 pursuit or what we call the F-21 um, relative to India as well. Um, so we're, we're keen on that, but we have to be careful and not get in front of the government to government relationship in that regard. Sure. Um, just then moving on to um, uh, production costs, you mentioned some staggering savings as the program has gone through. Um, but it takes, um, what, 20 years for the F-35 from flash to bang? And the sort of thing you're doing now in the skunk works, so do you see that time scale being significantly compressed by an order of magnitude, say, which is what our civil counterparts are looking at? We do. Um, so I talked briefly um, about a system called Star Drive. And I know we have talked as an industry about um, digital thread, um, but we are designing um, systems, assemblies, in a single digital environment. So think a requirement definition, think the engineering definition, passing those requirements in a single system to our suppliers, as well as maybe make within our own factories, and then actually producing the tooling as well as the, the product itself. And we're seeing um, span reductions from an assembly point of view on the order of magnitude, 40, 50, 60% reduction in span time. And then we do, we're doing deterministic assembly um, where we actually um, pre-drill all the holes full size at our supply base. We bring those in for final assembly. We're finding 100% compliance relative to that assembly. Um, so if you looked at an F-35 line, even though we have um, auto drills, um, there are still many hand-drilled holes on an F-35. And there's a lot of, of uh, rework required. You know, you have a human drilling a hole. You, you have opportunity for mistake or um, rework. But we are seeing 100% compliance relative to um, the artifacts that we're producing. So it will be, I see it as truly transformational in terms of manufacturability, and that will play into sustainability. So we're gonna take that digital thread and we'll play that forward into sustainment. So we have interchangeable part requirements on aircraft today. It could be an elevator, it could be a rudder, it could be a wing assembly. Um, and, and a lot of that today, um, there is still, I'll say, artisanship required to ensure that that occurs. My belief in the future, based on terministic assembly, is that that art that that art that, art that art artisanship will not be as required. And you may be able to produce that part, for example, shipboard, uh, 3D printing, or you know, depending on the complexity of the part. Um, and it's literally transferring a, di a digital data file along 
um, to, to do that assembly. So it's going to be transformational from my view. Sure. Yeah. Um, related to that, then uh, clearly uh, with any mature production process, the sticker price comes down. And Paul, you mentioned auto autonomous logistics, <laughs> Alice. Um, and you know the UK customer is um, highly attuned now to performance-based logistics um, with things like tornado attack, as was, and then now uh, with Typhoon and Titan. I mean, how, um, how close do you see the F-35 getting to those sorts of models? Uh, that's a really interesting question because I think there's that natural tension between when you have a multinational program, the benefits are lots of people buying lots of stuff gives you an economy of scale, which means the price of everything is coming down. As production processes and learned all the rest of it, as Greg's talked to, that's really helpful. Law of unintended consequences sometimes maybe is that you, you end up with different nations wanting to do slightly different things around how they sustain. And Greg just kind of spoke to that earlier in regards to the Swiss. People will want to have a sustainment solution that works for them. But then how do you cleave that into a global supply chain if they're all different arrangements? So I absolutely recognise the UK's desire to get to a kind of Titan-like model for, for F-35 in the UK. And we're continuing to support those discussions and work out how we best fit that in with how things are being done in, in the US. And, and there's a kind of, you know, US government, JPO, that's in that mix as well. So it's, it, is, it is tricky to navigate that sometimes, I think it's fair to say. But, you know, we absolutely recognize the fact that we need to help continue, as Greg said, on this great trajectory of sustainment cost, you know, coming down. We're not satisfied with the floor of that yet. I know Greg and Bridget and the team are focused on how do we make that even better in the future? Greg, I don't know if you want to pile in on that. Yeah, I was going to ask you, Greg, what, you know, what's the American customer looking for? From a, you know, it's a very broad question, specific to Alice, just a little more perspective. So Alice, think of a, you know, um, Paul made mention of a flip phone. So the Alice system, believe it or not, essentially is 20 years old. It was designed before the smartphone, right? And so what we have just done in the last two years um, in conjunction with the joint program office and the partnership is we've actually transferred um, and demonstrated a new hardware suite. So we've taken the software, if you will, and hosted it on a, on a modern today um, uh, hardware, integrated hardware design. And the processing power alone uh, was probably fourfold the capability. And so we've seen um, a very strong improvement in terms of the Alice system. The focus next is really to update the software architecture associated with that that's hosted on that hardware. But the intent really is that you can take that software design and hand it to a customer and they can implement it on any hardware they want as long as it meets the requirement set. So you're not locked in from a hardware perspective. And then the other is to create um, kind of firewalls, if you will. So the data is internal to the system and then you allow the interface to the operator to design you know, a sustainment solution set, maybe the way the information's presented, um, maybe the way you would do condition-based maintenance, um, but then it ties back into the global supply system in terms of ordering parts and, and, and the, more, the more mainstream elements of the program. So I think as we move forward, you're gonna see the ability to um, tailor um, you know, your specific desire requirement. Um, going forward. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's a question about um, investment in the UK, and Paul used the term cutting edge R&D. Um, how would you describe the degree of noble work that um, the program has brought into the UK? In other words, you know, the, the design engineering um, the production design, those sorts of things, and, and it possibly even certification, knowing our system. Yeah, that's another kind of broad question because, you know, when you look at that supply chain, everyone from the big players like BAE Systems and, and Rolls Royce, you know, down through Martin Baker, down to some of those niche suppliers, there's, there's no doubt, I don't think there's another program out there that would have delivered that level of technical competence into 
the UK economy from a defence point of view, because effectively you're building a component for, you know, designing a component, building it, certifying it for every user of the F-35, not just for, for, for a UK buy or a European buy. So I, I don't think, you know, I could easily quantify in numbers what it, what it means in terms of, you know, percentage of investment or anything like that particularly because you're talking about over such a long long scale of time but you know the reality is unlike you know i think lockheed martin uk we're about 2000 people you know give or take a, a, a small number the the, the f35 alone is about 20000 jobs in the uk supply chain and 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 the vast majority of those are you know high paying well compensated aerospace and defense type jobs so you know i i genuinely think you know what where else would you have got that kind of deal and, and and you know that going back to greg's point about being a level one partner from day one whilst all the work share competition was run on a best athlete basis back in the day mm -hmm. there is no doubt just that level of interaction that level of understanding what the requirements were that the uk had i think along with you know the incredible base that the uk has in terms of its inherent skills i think you brought those two things together back in the day and that that's why the uk has such a significant work share on the jet compared to anyone else that's out there yeah okay um we'll go into some broader subjects now if you don't mind and um some of it around the defense and security industrial strategy but again paul you mentioned uh, your vision of a world of collaboration, co-investment, um, focusing on social values, etc. And and you'll well remember uh, Paul Drayson's uh, industrial strategy with uh, strategic partnering arrangements, etc. And um, in many ways, there's something countercultural about the vision that you create there and the customer supplier interface that is drilled into every Ministry of Defence in uh, virtually every country. But you have a unique piece of experience because the military flying training contract scoring, third of the marks were for partnership. So say a bit more about how you think this transition could work and actually stick. Yeah, very interesting question. Oh God, we haven't got long enough, Brian. I'll take the whole 15 minutes. So, I think it starts with an acceptance that to get that collaboration, there's a joint requirement to invest and look at the risk profile together. So, part of the problem you get into, I mean, I'll, 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 you know, when we won UK MFTS back in 2006, we were preferred bidder, we put champagne corks, everyone's happy. And, and then we went to start the, the kind of negotiation to close the deal down. And it all got very transactional very quickly. And, and I remember saying to an unnamed, no longer working at the MOD official at the time. Um, so, so I thought we were partnering to do this. They're like, oh no, we're not partnering anymore. We're negotiating. <laughs> so why did you put a third of the marks against partnering? It blew my mind. But anyway, we got there in the end. Um, but, but the reality is you have to be able to have more open conversations. You have to look at investing together in technology development and not going down this path of we're going to infinitely define a requirement, spend five years defining a requirement, then spend two years competing for that requirement, then pick a winner, then negotiate, then get on contract. And, and, and by now, you know, we all know the story, six, seven years have passed of a procurement cycle and suddenly the front line again, well, actually, I, I, I now don't want that anymore because I now want this. And then you go back to the chain cycle. Anyone who works in the defense industry is on this call will, will understand that cycle. So I'll offer you an example from our postal business. We work with Post Nord in, uh, uh, um, uh, they do the postal business for the Scandinavian region. And we're their partner we work with them and what we do is we have a defined number of people assigned to develop applications for them and there's a set amount of money a set amount of hours you know that the, uh, the price is agreed 
and then you know they consistently tweak and define what they want in an agile sense so what we'll do is we'll, they'll go they'll come in one morning and go we've got this new problem is there something you can do about it and we kind of work with them on what that approach might be and then we'll do a couple of agile sprints and if that starts working or it looks like the right solution we carry it on and eventually we you know if that bit works and they want to contract for more of it we, we take it out of that development box and we then you know put it on contracts and it becomes a fine a firm capability for them but having that developmental sandbox where you can play i think is really important and i think you know we need to do more of that not just one-on-one -on -one mod and one industry player but find ways to do that more collaboratively across the industry and defense landscape and, and greg how does that vision um translate across the Atlantic, um, would you see the same sort of conversation as going on with the DOD? Yes, I mean, it's it's it's, it's essentially identical relative to the approach. Um, I think the, the struggle we're having more broadly in aerospace and defense is the, the shrinking of industry supporting that, right? The commercial sector is very dominant, um, more so than it used to be in the in the past. So it it really does make it a little more difficult. And I'm talking about the speed of technology. Paul alluded to it, um, but the cycle times that that we are undertaking, because you you gotta you, you gotta take something from a low in the United States, we call it technical level, a TRL of a three or a five, and we need to get it to an eight in order to get to that um, production contract, or we're gonna take this forward, um, is it, very competitive, and there's not a lot of dollars associated there. So and by the time you kind of get it to the seven or eight where you can get to the contract, time has gone by. But technology is screaming, screaming fast. So very much aligned with the comments Paul made. Thank you. Um, uh, just want to switch tack again to space. And uh, society, we have three um, areas of focus in the current era. The first is um, climate change. Second is future flight. Uh, which includes space, and the third is um, the aerospace professional of tomorrow. And just on space, um, you, uh, as Paul mentioned, you're in the vertical launch business, and the UK has not been in that business since Blue Streak, and there aren't many people around who will remember that. Um, but what, what enticed you uh, and to, to enter the UK's space sector? So for us, space is, you know, one of the most, you know, Lockheed Martin is structured into four big businesses areas. Greg runs one of them. Um, and space is one of those four areas. It's fundamental to everything we do as a company because we've been involved in space for the longest time. And we've been part of, I think, every one of the really kind of critical um, space missions from, from the U.S., and we know it's an area where it's important to do international growth. Um, there's definitely an appetite from the UK government. So, you know, I talked a little bit earlier about the Investment Council. And one of the things, you know, the questions the government has is, what does it take industry to invest in something? You know, uh, and this is broad, and not necessarily aerospace and uh, defence, but, you know, just broadly. And one of the things we look for is, like, a consistent demand signal. So is this something that's just a one-off or, or actually is this something where the UK as a government, as a nation, wants to have an enduring capability? Um, so, so that drove part of it. Also, you know, Scotland and the vertical launch provides some unique abilities to access specific orbits. And by the way, I'm going way beyond my technical competence here. I'm not a space engineer. But, you know, my understanding is that, that actually Scotland has some unique elements. So it could be that it's not just you know somewhere we where we launch for projects for the UK but hopefully will be somewhere where we're launching for international projects as well and providing that service and we're continuing to work with the UK Space Agency Space Command uh, the Space Council within government um, and and all the kind of government authorities that sit around that one of the interesting uh, questions I guess that still um, being kind of brought together is the regulatory framework around that. You know, what will that look like? Who will be the regulator? I assume, you know, my assumption is it's, it's the CAA, um, but I, I think that's yet to be confirmed. So, you know, one of the really interesting things to, to talk about between now and when we launch is actually who's regulating uh, it to get up there and go through through UK airspace, which we'll have to go through. 
exactly. And by that stage, we will, um, I'm assured, have uh, the UK space strategy on the streets where we just responded to the consultation uh, today, in fact. Um, what um, uh, you mentioned your efforts in climate change. Um, what, what advice, um, if any, are you being asked for by governments, by US government, UK government, um, about the climate implications of uh, capability that you provide? Is that a big issue yet in the US, Greg? It is. It's becoming more of an issue in terms of uh, actual um, product, the product itself, F-35, C-130s, what have you. Um, they are very interested. Uh, we are doing um, quite a bit of work in the energy sector relative to electricity driven, you know, engines and motors and systems, all electric systems as opposed to uh, fossil fuel kinds of systems. But probably more importantly is the operational aspect, our factories, uh, our office spaces and the green associated with that. Um, so for example, in Palmdale where the Skunk's work, Skunk Works is, we have um, two separate solar farms that supply electricity um, to the facility, right? Um, we also treat our own water in terms of uh, clean water. So um, go green, as we call it in the United States, is, is uh, very prominent. Uh, we have contractual requirements coming in that assure that we will continue to, to advance and make advancements in this regard. But we are along the, the, the types of numbers that Paul alluded to in terms of percentage, you know, landfill reduction and, and efficiency, we are making very similar kinds of advancements in the United States. Yeah, and in the UK, Paul, I mean, the the, um, uh, the fourth document in the suite around the integrated review was the UK's climate change and um, defence climate change strategy. So what's the dialogue like there? Yeah, very proactive. So the, the MOD ran a thing I'm sure most people are aware called the Defence Suppliers Forum. There's a climate change working group within that forum. So so industry and, and mod participating in some really good dialogue together on that. You see, you'll have seen public procurement uh, regulations coming out as well now around, you know, contracts over a certain value requiring a commitment to net zero. Um, you know, I think, you know, it comes alongside the UK government's leadership with COP26 coming up in Glasgow. It's very much on the agenda. And then, of course, as the MOD have looked at the definition of social value um, and scoring, which will be scoring criteria, we're, we're already seeing that come now into current you know, RFPs, invitations to negotiate, documents like that. There is a requirement in there to, 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 to make your commitments around how green your solution is going to be. I think one interesting thing that, that we're all wrestling with and is a good point of dialogue is, if you're a big company, right, then you, you, you probably don't want to measure people just on their, if you like, carbon neutrality on a single proposal. But how do you look at what is that company doing overall towards global warming? Because you could, you know, the law of perverse incentives would be, OK, to go net zero on this thing because you've got to win it and it's got to be net zero because it's a requirement. But you can shove the manufacturing of that somewhere else. And actually, it's, it becomes something, you know, you could gain it if you if you did it wrong. So I think and it's a really difficult one to judge because I think the approach for large companies versus SMEs would be probably quite different. And what might work well or what might allow, and I say work well, might, what might allow the government to measure a large company well might be very onerous for a small company to comply to, right? So, and you don't want to drive them, you know, to be uncompetitive. So I think there's a, there's a very intelligent look that needs to be done against it. And I think that's why DSF have set up a working forum to look at climate change and, you know, we'll, as Lockheed Martin, play our part in that dialogue. Yeah, good. Um, time is coming against us. And uh, just in our third area of interest, the aviation and aerospace profession of tomorrow, um, more of a comment really, but it's an interesting one. And it, um, it plays to the international flavor of both as society and the sector. But um, here is um, a member from India saying um, he wonders whether there's any scope for international aerospace skill development programs so that graduates from different parts of the world can bridge the aerospace industrial skill gap like something 
uh, like the International Apprenticeship Programme and Internship at Lockheed Martin. So um, for, uh, for a global company, is that something that has resonance with you? I think, from my view, go ahead, Paul. So I think from, from an international point of view, the one thing that you always rub up against in the defence world is, you know, citizenship requirements and security requirements. And that can make those kind of schemes more challenging to implement. That said, you know, we we have, you know, operations on and off in about 50 countries around the world. I'll probably have the number slightly wrong, but about 50 countries around the world. And we've certainly got, you know, in Canada, Australia, um, in uh, Poland, uh, we, we've got a lot of people on the ground. And in other countries, we're looking at how do we grow that presence. And there are countries around the world where we have put in programs to support education, we've put in discovery centers, you know, we've put in uh, research and development places into various countries where we're looking to, you know, garner and, and help talent along. The other thing I think we can do is be a flag bearer for the, the other industries in our supply chain because we're, we're kind of big and, you know, we've got a significant presence. You know, one of the reasons we support the 5% Club as a patron um, is, is to underline uh, our support, not just for Lockheed Martin's apprentice and graduate and early career schemes, which are excellent by the way, but the actual wider UK, because for us, we want to see a, a thriving skill base in engineering and technology throughout the UK supply chain, not just inside Lockheed Martin's, that doesn't do anybody any good. It's got to be across the UK. And I think, you know, where, where there is opportunity to do international collaboration, we absolutely would, would look to do that. But there is always that, you know, difficulty when you're specific in the defence sector around the requirements that governments will put on us about who can and can't work on our programmes. Greg? Sure. Yeah. I, I, I'm going to be, uh, we're doing it. Um, especially for the F-35 program. So um, we have apprenticeships where we're bringing, um, we call them interns in the United States, actual college students or um, early career. Um, so for many of the partner nations, part of the agreement in terms of the partnership was participation within the program. And so for example, if we, walk, if we stepped out of my office onto the floor today, we would be able to find um, partner nation participants um, conducting work, participating in the program directly. Wow. Thank you for that. And that's um, an optimistic note on which to close the uh, question period. But thank you very much for um, really interesting and in-depth look at both the F-35 and broader Lockheed Martin. Um, really striking um, how much technology has moved in the life of this program and uh, striking too that um, we have to make as much effort as uh, Paul described in adjusting our behaviors to keep up. If we're to preserve the good things that arise out of human interaction and collaboration, it's easy to find ourselves stepping back because the technology will do it. That can be the worst thing that could happen. And I know Tommy Sopwith recognized that. Uh, much of what uh, he wrote about is about the, uh, the human endeavor in all of this. So some very good uh, insights there, which are really relevant for now and for the future. So really grateful for your time. You both have busy programs and uh, it's very good of you to, uh, to spare the time for us. I will just uh, make mention of a couple of our next events. Uh, first of all, our Amy Johnson name lecture takes place on the 8th of July, and that's uh, delivered by Air Commodore Soraya Marshall, who uh, went through the MFTS program, I think, Paul, as a NAV, came to the F3. Uh, she's now Commandant of the Royal Air Force College at Cranwell, and her uh, address is entitled inspiring training and developing the next generation that'll be really interesting she's the first female commandant of the air force academy greg um and then secondly just before that the 5th of july and uh, somewhat related to this lecture we've got the lanchester lecture on aerodynamics and weapons integration 
and Trevor Birch, who's the technical fellow at the Defence Science and Technology Laboratory, will talk about the integration of weapons and other stores, both internally and externally. And the internal part is something that we wrestled with quite a lot in the early days of the F-35. That'll be a very interesting lecture, I feel sure. But uh, bear those in mind, all on the website, you can book as normal. Meanwhile, thank you all for uh, joining us tonight, and uh, I wish you a good evening wherever you are. Good night. Good night. Thank Thanks you, for Brian. Thanks, Brian. I really appreciate the opportunity.